Hypertonicity. Um, before I want to start with, with hypertonicity and salt, I want to convince you that there is no hypertonicity. And that is why um, I've been in trouble for a decade, I would say, because there was no hypertonicity. And if you send a paper on hypertonicity and at tissues to reviewers who are convinced that there is no hypertonicity, you're in trouble. And the reason that there is no hypertonicity in the body comes from an experiment that actually Wilhelm Wundt did um, in 1850, I guess. And uh, he had a silver electrode and was the first, uh, and with a silver electrode, he could measure chloride in the urine. Um, and what he did is he set up the, well, the experimental approach that has dominated our way in thinking salt and water balance for 150 years now. And that is an experiment that you see here, and you find it in every nephrological textbook. Um, this is a human being eating 10 grams of salt. That's an apple rice diet. That's what nobody wants to eat and what Kempner gave his patients to treat their hypertension. And what you see here is a step change, a, a fast change from very low to quite high salt intake. Today we would perhaps use 300 or 400 millimoles. At that time they used 150. Um, so there's a step change in, in, in salt intake. And then you see how the kidney adapts to this step change. And you see that it takes the kidney about, well, one, two, three, four, five, six days until this new level of salt intake is achieved. And that's what we call steady state. What goes, what goes in must come out. Homeostasis, um, Walter Cannon, 1930, The Wisdom of the Body. So what comes in must, go, must come out. Otherwise, and that's what you see here because it takes a while, otherwise you accumulate salt. And here, this subject has accumulated 150 millimoles of sodium or salt, which is nine grams. So his body weight should increase by nine grams, but weird enough, his body weight increased by one kilogram. And that's the next idea, um, next assumption that body sodium is always paralleled by water retention in the body. Because serum sodium concentration is 150 millimole per liter, nine grams of salt, one liter of water, and that's what he has accumulated here. And that's the idea that now the extracellular volume is increased and that this leads to an increase in blood pressure. And that makes clear that we have to have a lot of regulatory mechanism designed to make sure that there is no change in body sodium content because otherwise we would accumulate too much water, our blood pressure would increase, and we would have edema wherever, um, in the lungs or, well. So total body sodium content is to be constant, very constant. So the basic assumption or the paradigm on which all these things are built up is steady state, Sodium is always paralleled with commensurate amounts of water, and that's why there is no hypertonicity, because if you talk about hypertonicity, you have more sodium relative to water. And, um, yeah, constancy. So that's what we have, and what we did then was designing a research program on this evidence. And, of course, you then focus on the kidney and ask yourself, how is that organized that everything that went in comes out? Um, and if you identify that this is the kidney, then you would perhaps identify some cells, some in the distal tubule that was done in the 40s, 50s. And then you understand that there's transport and that there are perhaps channels. And after a while, you focus on genes that are responsible for the kidney and how the kidney handles the sodium. Now, that's all fine as long as you do not do the reverse approach. And everybody agreed that the reverse experiment to this is just coming back to a low sodium content within a few minutes and see how the kidney then readjusts. That's the reverse approach. But is it really the reverse experiment? Because what we have tested here is fast adaptation to dietary extremes. So isn't the reverse experiment, which we have never done, the response of the kidney to constant salt intake. I mean, we have ext extrapolated that if we eat constant salt, there will also always be exactly the same amount of salt um, in the urine. So if we eat 12 grams of salt, we will find 12 grams of, urine, uh, of salt in the urine. Now, we did that reverse approach, 
and we reasons are not, not important, but we managed to do a long-term sodium balance study. First experiment for 105 days, second experiment for 205 days in humans living under thermal constant conditions. And we brought them all the food, and what we did is that we clamped salt intake constant. And the subjects ate everything for months and collected every drop of urine they made. The prediction would have been that after five days, this red line excretion exactly matches salt intake steady state concept, but it does not. There's no reason for the sodium to meander around this clamped salt intake. And if you look more closely, you, you see that there's a six day rhythm, which is driven by aldosterone and cortisol without any dietary challenge, which is a rhythm that is generated by the body. And I do not want to go into chronobiology in the interest of time. Um, what I want to show you now is um, that, first of all, these data are accurate enough to now calculate changes in body sodium content within 200 days, because really, in the end, what came into the simulator, into the facility where we did the experiment, really came out through their urine. We recovered 95% of the dietary salt with, within 200 days. But the day-to-day -day basis was somehow different, and if we now see that he sometimes accumulates and then excretes and again accumulates. The question is, what happens to total body sodium? And that's what you see here. And that is even more weird. When we had them on 12 grams and on 9 grams and on 6 grams and then on 12 grams of salt again, you see that the changes in total body sodium did not give a damn about the amount of salt that had been eaten. And instead, we found an about one month to two monthly rhythm of total body sodium with, well, changes in total body sodium content of about 400 millimoles. Now, the prediction would be that this subject um, accumulates about two to three liters of water, expands his extracellular volume, increases blood pressure. And here's his body weight at the same time. And you see there's, well, even a decrease in body weight. So the obvious question is, where is the salt? It cannot be in the blood volume. And if it's not in the blood volume, it cannot be controlled by the kidney exclusively. And that's what I would like to talk about in the next 15 minutes. So just to have it a little bit more iconoclastic, we know that anatomically there are three compartments. Intravascular, interstitial, intracellular. What we have done during the last 150 years is that we have summarized, simplified the model and summarized these two spaces into one extracellular space where sodium is the major cation, which acts to hold water, determines extracellular water content. And what we think of the kidney, and I will come to, back to this dialyzer picture later, is that the kidney, in the end, dialyzes, purifies bloodstream. And our way of thinking total body sodium balance was that this purified bloodstream then passively dialyzes the interstitium. And what I would like to show you in a minute is that the concentration here and here is absolutely different, and that there are additional regulatory mechanisms by which the body purifies the interstitium. In other words, we pee once. Once we pee from the interstitium into the bloodstream, and this is actively regulated, and then from blood into urine, and we know a lot about it that. So to sum that up, um, I now want to talk about a three-compartment model, where sodium is stored in the skin, which is the largest organ of our body, and where it also where it is perhaps bound to glycosaminoglycans, and again, I, I cannot go into details in the interest of time there, and where there's hypertonicity of the interstitium, which might be very important for regulating total body sodium. The evidence is somehow published um, that there might be real differences. Now, we just got a paper this Monday where we addressed this whole issue again in just in rats to s demonstrate in one setting how different things might be. These rats were fed a low salt diet, these rats were fed a high salt diet, and you see if you measure serum sodium concentration, chloride concentration, or small LRT, there's no difference. That's what you expect. If we are working in the clinic, we draw blood, and we hardly never see any changes in serum sodium concentration, no hypertonicity. Now, if you chemically analyze the skin sodium content in the same animals, 
you notice that there is massive sodium accumulation and chloride accumulation in that skin. That doesn't say much because it could still be isotonic. That would mean that there should be a lot of volume retention in the skin as well. But if we then measure serum so the concentrations of sodium and chloride at the tissue by also analyzing water content, we suddenly see that concentrations are higher in the skin. Mm -hmm. So in blood, isotonicity, and here there's something that might be hypertonicity if all this sodium were not bound to these negative charged surfaces of the interstitial space. So what Helge Wieck in Norway then did is we, we, we started being interested in blood pressures and also in another pressure that somehow has been overlooked for, for, for years again, and these are interstitial fluid pressures. Interstitial pressures are negative. That's important to, to reabsorb fluids. And you see that if all this occurs, there's arterial hypertension, which is quite massive, and in parallel, there's massive interstitial hypertension, which we again cannot measure as medical doctors. Now, what Helge did at the same time to prove that there's hypertonicity is that he cuts pieces of the skin and directly measure it on a vapor pressure osmometer. And here you see plasma osmolality, low salt, high salt, exactly the same. And if we look in the skin level, here's the hypertonicity. And this is plus 20 milli osmo, which you perhaps might think it's not much, but it's a physiological disaster. Because at, if we think it model-wise, um, at 37 degrees Celsius, um, osmotic pressures um, that are generated by 20 millimoles are something about 500, 600 millimeter mercury. Um, so there are massive osmotic forces that we are not aware of in the interstitium, and I would, uh, what I like, would like to show you now is um, that they are really regulated. If we look into, if we look into the skin, in animals fed high salt or low salt, low salt, high salt, we suddenly notice all these red dots. And these red dots are macrophages, and their plan is not to destroy the tissue. They're not bad. Their plan is to regulate salt and water balance. What they do is that they sense the sodium overload in the interstitium, and by a transcription factor, ton EBP, then induce a regulatory cascade. This ton EBP binds to VGFC, vascular endothelial growth factor C, and suddenly this li little small macrophage, which usually is thought to only take care of viruses, bacteria, perhaps autoimmunity, takes care of salt and water balance by secreting VGFC in the interstitium. Suddenly it occurs, and all that comes from the macrophages. This VGFC now binds to VGFR2 in blood vessels in the skin and induces enos expression. Thereby, the, blood, the, the macrophage might vasodilate vascular tree and could lower blood pressure. And the VGFC also binds to VGFR3 in the interstitium and leads to massive changes in the lymph capillary network in the skin, and thereby it could produce, um, could um, induce chloride clearance and sodium clearance from the interstitium, and that would be the regulated process I've been talking about, transfer of electrolyte from the interstitium into the bloodstream. Now, the thing was, that's quite a while ago, when we blocked that, either by feeding them clotronate, not allowing the macrophages to enter, or by using, by the way, SEPO's um, um, construct of soluble VGFR3 to trap away all this VGFC, we always produced salt-sensitive hypertension. So it was really the macrophages regulating the whole story. And that led us proposing a model where we said, okay, this clearance process is well known, the whole fo world has focused on it, and no question that this is important. I mean, if that doesn't work and we cannot transfer the salt from our body to the external world, of course, the whole system is messed up. But the point we wanted to make is that there is a second clearance process that we have overlooked where immune cells exert homeostatic immune function and where it is suddenly the immune system and the lymph capillary network that is important for maintenance of electrolyte composition and blood pressure in the body. Now, if we propose a local regulation of electrolyte, I mean, this would be the local, this is what we always thought, passively, passive equilibrium. Now we understand that there's salt storage in the skin, there are those sensors. They produce VGFC, 
induce hyperplasia of lymph capillaries, thereby induce the clearance and regulate salt and water balance. Now, what would we need to prove that it is really this transcription factor, TON-EVP? Um, what we did is that we specifically knocked out TON-EVP in the macrophages with a FLOX strategy, Liz M. Cree, um, TON-EVP FLOX mice. And these are mice which are okay, and those are mice where we have knocked out this transcription factor, and you see if we feed them high salt, TON-EVP mRNA expression goes down. Now this TON-EVP binds to the VGFC promoter, and if TON-EVP is not there, VGFC mRNA doesn't go up. And it really looks as if, as if it were fake, but it was really the same values. And that also was true for VGFC, so VGFC levels were low. VGFC was gone if we knock out TON-EVP in the macrophage. Funny enough, chemoattraction was not altered by ton EVP, so the macrophages still went into the salt overloaded tissue. Now, what we had was VGFC was gone. Next prediction is that lymph capillaries do not become hypoplastic. This is wild type, intact animals, low salt diet, no macrophages in the interstitium, no VGFC production, lymph capillaries pretty small. Now look at that, it's really amazing. This is the change with high salt diet. That doesn't happen in the kidney at all. The skin is extremely um, reactive. Here, high salt, sodium storage, macrophages went inside, produced VGFC, and this is the hyperplasia. Now, these are animals where we have mutated the Tony VP but did not cut it out because the lysum Cree is not brought into the organism. And here we now deleted the Tony VP, and you see that the hyperplasia is away. So we block the hyperplasia, and if we have blocked the hyperplasia in the skin, then we should have induced that upstream failure of clearance of electrolytes and in the interstitium. And that's what you see here, chloride content, massive chloride accumulation, and massive increase in skin chloride concentration. And if we now draw blood in these animals, no change in chloride concentration. Because the kidney is intact, we have induced an upstream renal failure of that kidney in the skin. And now last question, does that lead to blood pressure? Um, and indeed, they have salt-sensitive hypertension. So now by knocking out the transcription factor in macrophages, we induce salt-sensitive hypertension. Now we know that it's really the macrophage with this mechanism regulate blood pressure and electrolyte composition in the interstitium. It, of course, did not tell us how the macrophage does that. Because, as I told you, VGFC could bind to VGFR2 and vasodilate blood vessels or bind to lymphatics and um, um, induce the clearance. So um, a cardiologist, I guess, would say, well, it must be NO production. And a nephrologist would say, well, it must be clearance. So what would you guess? So who, if we block here, um, or say, if we block here, and we leave the system open, would you think blood pressure would increase? What is more important, lymph capillaries or NO? We didn't know it either. So we did the experiment. No guess um, in the audience. We got an antibody, which will, be, which will come soon in the clinic, which is anti-VGFR3. And thereby, we blocked VGFC, VGFR3 in the action. Prediction is that macrophages go in there Electrolytes are not transported through the lymph capillary system, which will make them mad. They will produce ton EVP, VGFC to overcome the whole thing. VGFC will bind to VGFR2. NO will be produced, and then we will have an answer to it. If blood pressure doesn't increase, it's really NO. And here are the data. Low salt, high salt controls. The macrophages are in. This is CD68. They have produced VGFC. This VGFC has bound to VGFR2 and switched on ENOS in blood vessels and led to hyperplasia of the lymph capillary bed in the skin. Now we do the same in the animals which are treated with the antibody. High salt macrophages go in. They produce a lot of VGFC. It's even more VGFC if we look into that more carefully. This VGFC binds to VGFR2 because the receptor is open. Enos is high, lymph capillaries are blocked, and blood pressure increases within 10 days by 90 millimeter mercury. 
So the blood pressure really goes with the lymphatics. Now, just to show you that, because it's so weird, what we really did is we, I mean, we co co correlated lymph capillary density in the ear with blood pressure. So left ear and blood pressure. Um, so low salt, all the individual mice that we had, because it's so difficult to believe. Um, no hyperplasia, that's what a hypoplastic lymph capillary bed looks like. And here are the antibody-treated animals. And here are their blood pressures. And what we now do is we simply correlate gray values with blood pressure. And that's what we're doing here. Here are the animals which could compensate electrolyte homeostasis by intact lymph capillaries. Blood pressure is pretty low. And now you see the better the antibody blocks this hypoplastic response, higher blood pressure goes. And this is paralyzed by chloride accumulation, not sodium accumulation, chloride accumulation, not water accumulation, chloride accumulation, hypotonic chloride accumulation, as you see here. So yes, it's the, lymph it's the macrophages, it's Tony P, and it's the lymphatics that regulate salt-sensitive hypertension in this model. Now, this is all animal research curiosity, and I have understood that you are very interested in human research. So um, we did not sleep there. And the point was, we of, I mean, why, why could we do that? We, we simply decided that there is no need to draw another blood sample because sodium concentration will be again the same. And that there is no need to focus on weight changes because there's no volume ac accumulation. It's hypertonicity, it's electrolyte accumulation. So we said what we, re what we really need is doing the same as we did in animals, analyzing them chemically. And that in humans, of course, has to be non-invasively. And that's why we built that little coil, which can measure sodium content in tissues and ask ourselves whether this sodium accumulation occurs in humans as well. What you see here is lower limp. We didn't have that much money, so everything we did at the moment is with a knee coil. And here you see four test tubes with increasing sodium concentration, so everything that is white is sodium. This is a 24-year-old man who is healthy, and this is an 85-year-old man with hypertension, and you see that he's massively sodium overloaded. These are, um, this is water. Of course, there's no volume retention, so hypertonic accumulation in skin and in muscle, now you might say that this is only one. Here are 113. And you see that all of them, they we all accumulate a lot of sodium with age, while water content is maintained constant. constant. So there's really this hypertonic sodium concentration at the tissue level. Again, um, no marker that far discovered in the blood. Um, but I think the direct measurements would do. Um, and weird enough, this sodium storage really resembles essential hypertension. We know in essential hypertension that it occurs with age, and this here again in the cohort, blood pressure increased with age, um, and sodium storage increased with age. We, knew, we know that, blood, that well, females do everything better, um, and I'm good with that, um, and also that their blood pressure is better. The only thing that I do not like, I find there's one thing in gender research that I find it extremely unfair that they live longer. Um, and that's why I really, I, I'm a fan of, of, of gender research. I think um, we have to take care of why people like uh, men I, uh, die earlier. So um, we found this gender difference again in, in skin sodium content. Um, and now comes the VGFC. And perhaps that's a biomarker. So these are, this is unpublished evidence. Um, so VGFC levels, this internal clearance factor really decreased when skin sodium content increased. Now, this is an association, and the last thing I want to show you is how we thought we could perhaps methodologically or experimentally approach this hand and egg question. And we thought that dialysis patients would be the perfect um, population to study um, skin sodium storage. That's, again, unpublished evidence, because what we... I mean, if there are two clearance processes, we never know what the relative contribution of the kidney or the interstitium really was. Now, in dialysis patients, if they are anuric, we can control it. And what we do is we remove blood volume 
thereby we um, reduce sodium content in blood. And the idea then is that there's this passive clearance followed by the equilibrium. And we now thought, okay, if we remove one or two liters of fluid from, from blood, then those patients where VGFC might be blocked, for example, by a soluble factor, VGFR3 receptor that I just showed you, then this upstream clearance might be, re, uh, might be defective. So what we did is that we measured tissue sodium content in dialysis patients before and after dialysis, and to our delight, um, we now really can monitor sodium removal at the tissue level after dialysis. Um, and this is an example for, pa uh, for a patient who very rapidly, in response to dialysis, removes sodium from tissues. But what you see here is that there are also some patients where it simply doesn't happen, some of them. And we start asking ourselves, could it be that the VGFC regulatory axis is inhibited in them? So we, in parallel, I think we now meanwhile have 30. We measured soluble FLIT4. This is a soluble receptor of VGFC, a trap of which really traps VGFC out of the circulation. And indeed, those patients where sodium removal at the tissue level was very good had low soluble FLIT4 levels, not much VGFC trap, while those patients where there was actually no sodium removal at all had quite high levels. And that's what we have that far. Um, so the higher the VGFC trap, and perhaps the lower the amount of biologically active VGFC, um, the worse sodium removal at the tissue level. Um, and these are the data that we have at the moment. IL-6 is not yet stati statistically um, significant. So to summarize that, um, I have shown you in the beginning, it was a long journey, 25 minutes through salt and water balance. I showed you that um, there is hypotonicity at the tissue level, that this is regulated, that we cannot see it clinically because it's hidden. You cannot find it when in your blood samples, and changes in body weight will not help you either, and that's a problem. Um, and this now, of course, leads to the question, what is clearance? It was enough for us to say, well, the kidney does the job and everything else is, uh, is negative. Now we understand that there is storage and that the storage is regulated, actively regulated through the lymph capillary in bed and that really hitting the system locally at the tissue level leads to sodium accumulation at a perfectly intact kidney. Now we know that there is sodium storage in humans as well that it increases with age, that it resembles the gender or mimics the gender difference we know in salt, in, in essential hypertension in humans. We do not know whether this is a disease yet. That's why we want a multi-center trial with 2,000 patients. We want to follow them up for five years and see whether those patients who are in sodium excess really are at risk for developing cardiovascular um, disease. And only if it's a disease, then we will focus on how sodium storage could be prevented or which drugs will mobilize sodium uh, from these stores. And what I'm most interested, I must admit, is the question, what is really immune function? Because I believe it's much more than adaptive or innate immunity. Um, I'm, sh I'm really convinced that the plan of immune cells is also to make sure that there are not too high levels of salt and water.